All right, let's start to walk these drives. To start out, we have these different enclosure types. So depending on the environment that these drives can be subjected to, the enclosures vary quite a bit. Anything uh, from an open chassis, a NEMA 1, uh, NEMA 3R, 4, NEMA 4, 4X, and even 12. Just to, to name some of the, the enclosures that are available. Their uses uh, could be anywhere from indoor use with a, a light degree of protection. So maybe there's just a, a little bit of dust, but a fairly clean uh, room that this drive's located in, all the way to uh, maybe it's for outdoor use on top of a rooftop in the middle of a summer in Texas or a winter in Chicago. So just varying degrees of enclosures. So they, they change a little bit uh, depending on what kind of environment you're going to locate them in. And some of these even uh, have hose down capabilities. So you can spray them down with a hose like the, the NEMA 4X. All right, let's talk about the different drive levels. We have our control, power, and main circuit. So our control, is uh, where we actually are getting our command, our, our brains located at. Then we have our, our power circuit. That's kind of the, the talking in between the, the main circuit and the, the control logic and relaying the necessary uh, information for, let's say, feedback or uh, just uh, maybe we want to monitor DC bus voltage, or we want to see what our output current looks like. So our current waveform. And then we have our main circuit, which is our higher voltage part of our system, where we're going to be moving all of this power and uh, converting it to something that's more usable for our motor. So instead of our motor being stuck at running at 60 hertz, this motor is now going to have the capability of running, uh, depending on the motor type, uh, varying speeds up to that 60 hertz or even higher than that. So that's with the main circuit. Let's start out by talking about control. So our controls broken up into a couple different things. Our input most of the time probably comes from our, our digital operator. So this is where you can input parameters, uh, set up uh, overloads, any kind of motor protection. Maybe you want to set uh, anything as basic as uh, XL and D cell times for your motor. So you want it to your motor to XL to 60 Hertz in 10 seconds or D cell in 10 seconds. Those can all be set with this operator or keypad. And you also have the ability to run from your keypad if you would want to, or um, run from, which we'll talk about in a second, maybe our terminal board and uh, receive a 4 to 20 signal or 0 to 10 signal for our frequency reference. So telling us what speed we would like to run at. Some options could be available with our drive. This one uh, just happens to have a encoder card located on it. So this drive could possibly have a encoder feedback. So it would be running one of our tighter control methods. So the performance should be very good out of this uh, motor that we're connecting to. <clears throat> then we have our terminal board full of our inputs and our outputs, all of our, our digital, so our ones and our zeros and our uh, analog signals, so our zero to 10 or four to 20 signals are all located on our terminal board down here. Uh, this terminal board is nice. It uh, has non-volatile RAM, so 
if something was ever to happen to the rest of your drive, but your terminal board was okay, you could you could just use your old terminal board in your new drive as long as uh, certain things are kept the same, like it's the same size and uh, control method and uh, software revision. Then we have our control board. So this is the brain of our drive. This is tells the rest of my drive circuit when to fire the IGBTs, which we'll talk about a little later, or protect my motor, so observe uh, current, or even protect my drive too. So um, this is where all the those calculations are done. Now let's move to the the power section. So this is the connection between the control board with all of our logic and. Um, goes to our power board or gate drive board, which is located uh, right above the operator in this picture. For this webinar, I just chose, a, this is a A1000, I believe it's a 139 amp drive, so a medi medium sized drive for, uh, for these uh, pictures. So your power board or gate drive board is going to output the signal to fire your IGBTs. It's going to read back signals from your, your main circuit, like your DC bus level and your DCCT readings. So your, uh, your current readings that you're checking all the time, those all come through this power board, which convert it to something usable for the control board to look at. So it's the connection between that uh, low power control board and the high power main circuit. And that's done through uh, this transformer. It's just gonna switch that uh, high voltage to something usable to power that control board. <clears throat> These, these vary depending on the drive size. Some of our micro drives actually have all of these boards and the main circuit soldered, sandwiched together. So some of those smaller drives are gonna be, uh, if you're trying to repair them yourself, are going to be a, not as useful to repair, but luckily they're, they're pretty cheap, so you might as well just uh, toss it and grab a new one anyways, but... Uh, Anything, anything I think over 25 horsepower on our A1000s, not a micro drive would uh, probably use a board similar to this. From our control to our power, our gate drive board, now we're on to our main circuit where all the magic's happening. So our drives nowadays are converting going from AC to DC and then back to an AC waveform. This uh, this output or this AC waveform, I, I would not call it a sinusoidal waveform. It's more of a simulated AC waveform and you guys will notice this later. So for our input side, you notice up in the top corner, we just have our picture we're talking about just the input, so the converter side. This is made up of some small capacitors and uh, these units right here, these are MOVs, okay? So these are going to try to get rid of any uh, excessive voltage transients that could come in, let's say like a uh, lightning strike or something like that. It's gonna try to protect this more expensive part right here. So these, these input diodes that we have coming in here. This is a diode out of that uh, larger drive that I showed before, that A1139 amp drive. Right here is our incoming AC. That's where it would come in from this side. And then it's going to output our positive and negative portions <clears throat> that we output from our diode. So a diode is kind of a, like a, a one-way 
a one-way train. So it's going to allow this waveform to pass on one side, but not on the other side. Okay, so it's going to kind of chop this AC in half and convert it to something uh, that looks like DC, which it will evolve from this uh, as we move to the, the next section of this uh, drive. So we have our, our three phase incoming, uh, 120 degree electrically isolated phases coming through here that get chopped in half so this lower portion would be missing until we come over to our other side of our diode which this diode right here has the upper and lower portion all in one module so some of the smaller drives actually have all of these in one module and even have the output on the same module so those micro drives this is all actually one piece here, and then the capacitors will be uh, probably soldered onto a, another board on those smaller drives. So that's our input or converter side of our drive. Then we move to our DC bus, okay? So we've uh, got the top part of that uh, waveform that we chopped in half with our diodes. And since we have this capacitor here, we're actually going to start to fill in these voids so it's going to smooth out this, this DC bus ripple, which is very bad for a drive. So things that would cause excessive DC bus ripple would be like if you would try to single phase a drive, uh, you can do it. You just have to deal with a big D rate. So that would cause excessive DC bus ripple. But if we have three phase incoming, you have that uh, 120 degrees evenly distributed waveform going across here for all three phases. So it smooths out that DC bus quite a bit with the help of this capacitor. Also, whenever you first start up a drive, you're going to notice that it probably makes some clicking noises. This is because we're running through a soft charge circuit. So the soft charge circuit's made up of a contactor or a set of contacts. This is just spreads out the load a little bit here for this larger contactor. <clears throat> and then we have a resistor. So we would not want to just hit this DC bus capacitors whenever they're not charged with our, our diodes chopped in half waveform because uh, that would just act like a short and would be very bad. So we have to slowly charge up these DC bus capacitors and we do this with this soft charge circuit. When we first start up, we'll run through this resistor and slowly charge up these capacitors. Once we reach a certain level, the power board that we talked about before will read this and change and uh, then the contactor is going to close and we're going to get our full power running through to these capacitors and finish charging them and then we we have uh, all of our power available that's from our incoming three-phase power I didn't mention it and I don't have a picture but we some of these drives do have DC bus reactors uh, these are good for reducing some of our input harmonics uh, probably around three to five percent uh, reduction in input harmonics so you guys have probably heard a lot of uh, stuff about input harmonics some drives have these sometimes they're optional and you can add your own if you would like then we move to the last section where all the all the magic happens so our output uh, section of our drive or our inverter. This is where our, our IGBTs are located, our insulated gate bipolar transistors, okay? These have DCCTs, 
So instead of using CTs, we use DC CTs because our insul insulated gate bipolar transistor actually puts out a waveform that looks <clears throat> looks like this. This would actually be at a voltage output waveform. Our current waveform is going to look a little smoother, but we actually use DC CTs instead of CTs on drives. We also have this uh, section here. Those are snubber capacitors for our IGBTs. IGBTs are similar to like MOSFETs, except a, uh, a MOSFETs really for low voltage, high, really high uh, switching frequencies. IGBT is for higher voltages and a little bit lower or quite a bit lower uh, switching frequencies. Still fast, not anything like the old days, but uh, they're, they're getting faster and faster too. So <clears throat> look for newer drives, uh, being able to run higher switching frequencies. These IGBTs have a gate that opens and closes. I like to think of this like a light switch. So you flip on and off your light in your house. That's how I like to think of this gate. So turning on and off this, uh, this power. But this happens very quick, okay? We'll, we'll talk about how quick and uh, what that looks like in just a second. But just know that these are switching very fast, anywhere from uh, 2 kilohertz to uh, upwards of uh, 15 kilohertz. Okay, so that's the gate. And then we have a emitter and a collector. Okay. And also this portion here. This is our freewheeling diode. So this allows our drive to take in regen. Okay. So whenever we decelerate a motor, we're actually running through these diodes and we're filling back up our capacitors. Once we fill up our capacitors though, they have a certain limit. The problem with uh, this drive is you can't go past this front end. So once, we, once that comes in through the diodes, it, it can't back backtrack back out into the, our uh, incoming line. So we're kind of stuck to fill up these capacitors. That's why trip people uh, can trip out on things like over voltage. So we have a very high uh, DC bus voltage. And I don't think I mentioned it before, but uh, you can always uh, do a quick calculation to figure out what kind of DC bus voltage you have by uh, whatever your incoming voltage is, times it by the square root two and then that will be your DC bus voltage. Okay, so we have these freewheeling diodes that allow us to regen back into these capacitors during like a D-cell. If there's different ways to mitigate that issue, you can uh, use resistors to burn off excess energy, you can use one of our RC5s, DC5s to regen back on the line that way. You could add excess uh, capacitors, or if you have another drive, you could do common busing between the drives. There's a bunch of different possibilities to try to, to get out of that uh, over-voltage scenario, or just increase your uh, decel time. <laughs> That's the simplest way. So, each of these sets of IGBTs are going to output a waveform. Okay, so we're building that sinusoidal or simulated sinusoidal waveform. Okay, so we have a positive and negative portion for each of these. So each of these are going to have their own waveform. So we, we are outputting three phase simulated AC to our motor. Since we're doing that, we now have the ability to control what our frequency is and what our average voltage is.
So let's talk a little bit about IGBT switching. So when do these fire and things like that? Remember these are firing very fast. So T1, T2 shown up here is going to be for this first set. Let me get my mouse over there. So these two, and then whenever we move to the second set, we have our second waveform, and then so on, our third waveform. Now, we're going to work our way through this waveform, and at the beginning, let's just focus on this first output voltage waveform. Okay, so just focus on T1, T2, and what you're going to be looking at are these, these two. Hopefully, we'll see just our positive portion of our waveform blinking. So whenever it, uh, it uh, blinks, that means that's switching. So this switching is happening very fast. So we're just trying to simulate that so you can uh, see this uh, switching pattern. So focus on T1, T2, and there we go. There. So you notice how on these first two, which is for this waveform, this upper waveform, that just this top one was firing, okay? This bottom one will start, fi start firing, but we haven't reached that point yet. So if we go down to T2, T3, you're going to focus on these two. This is the upper portion of that waveform. This is the lower portion. So we this one should come on just for a second. And then this other one should start switching after that. So let's see if that happens. And that happens. Okay. And then our last waveform here, we have our, our two uh, IGBTs here. And we're going to start, looks like we're starting on the negative portion, so this lower one will start mm -hmm. up and then come over to our upper portion. So let's see if that happens. And there it goes. Okay. And the same thing's going to be happening as we move further, further through this. <clears throat> so you notice that uh, for these, now it's just the bottom IGBT firing. And then through here, hitting uh, the wrong button. <laughs> For the second one, so these two, you're going to notice that it's the negative portion, and then the upper one will start to fire. And then so on for the third phase. So I think that shows pretty good how that switching happens. If you notice that... These two never fire at the same time. If those two fire at the same time, that's not going to be good for your system. So there's usually this little bit of off time where we make sure that both of those don't fire. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, pulse width modulation. A lot of you guys have probably heard about pulse width modulation. We're going to... Follow from this, this is an actual output uh, voltage waveform. We're going to use this and just use a simplified one. So with pulse width modulation, we vary the width of this pulse. This pulse is always going to have uh, our full DC bus available. So this goes up to our full D DC bus and actually can get even larger with long lead links due to voltage transients. So you're going to see full DC bus at the top of this. But with the IGBT, we're able to vary how long we stay on. So if we're trying to form this sinusoidal output, we're not going to stay on very long at the beginning. So for this full cycle that's available, or this full period that's available for this IGBT to stay on, we're only staying on a very small amount of time. Then as we start to build our sinusoidal waveform, we start to stay on more and more. Okay, Until towards the middle, we kind of saturate and we stay on the whole time. And then same thing happens with the other side. We start staying on less and less until we reach that zero point. 
and then the other set of IGBTs start firing. Okay? You can't really talk about uh, pulse width modulation and not talk about carrier frequency. We talked about it before. IGBTs have a carrier frequency of uh, usually they can be less than 2 kilohertz, but 2 kilohertz all the way up to 15 kilohertz. This carrier frequency is inputted into this volt this voltage waveform as a triangle wave <clears throat> and we use whatever frequency reference we want so if this is 60 Hertz so how we vary the frequency this this wave that we're trying to make is just gonna get uh, squished or wider so you know the more squished it is the faster we're going to uh, our motors going to turn so you know, if you're running some high-speed machine, this could be, uh, you know, 400 hertz or more could be possible. Oh, click the head. And uh, maybe you're wanting to run at low speed. As long as your motor is capable of running at this low speed, you could, uh, you could be running with a very, very wide or long stretched out uh, part of your wave. So how this works is this carrier frequency is set, so it has a set area that it works in, but depending on what frequency reference we want, we will just choose our intersecting points from there that picks how wide of a pulse we need. As our wave starts to build up, our intersecting points get a little wider, so that's why our pulse gets larger and so on up until where we saturate where we're on the whole time and then we start to come back down these points of intersection start to get smaller and smaller and that's how we would make for this example an upper part of a uh, one of our uh, waveforms got a question here what causes noises in the motor line changing gears Oh, like, like changing gears. Oh, okay. Um, so what causes uh, noises in the motors? Uh, carrier frequency, you're going to notice if you want run a motor across the line, it's going to be real quiet and nice. And then whenever you run it with a, a drive, it could be at low carrier frequencies. It, uh, it could be a little more noisier. That's just the actual vibrations in the laminations that make up a motor that we talked about before. Remember that uh, that stator has those little uh, chunks of uh, iron broken up in between there, and that's those laminations actually kind of vibrating and making that noise. Now, as you increase your carrier frequency, you're going to notice that you uh, that noise kind of goes away. Well, it's just because it goes to a higher frequency that you can't hear. Or that I can't hear anymore anyways. <laughs> so that was a good question. So there's carrier frequency. <clears throat> we were talking about our voltage waveform before. If you look at our current waveform, it looks great. So our current waveform, I like to call it a shark tooth pattern. So voltage is instantaneous. So that's why it kind of looks like it's a, a that uh, square wave that's uh, alternating, okay? But current takes time to change. So whenever that uh, IGBT switches on and off, it's going to go off, but it can't shut off instantaneously. So this middle point here, it takes time to shut off. So it comes down, and by the time it's, at this point, the drive's already ready to fire the IGBT again. So we fire the IGBT again, and it makes this little sawtooth pattern going down through here. So as you increase your carrier frequency, what do you think is going to happen to this sawtooth pattern? It's probably going to get a lot smaller and smoother, right? <clears throat> so our current waveform going to our motor will be uh, better, as long as we don't have a lot of... Uh, voltage transients and uh, long lead length issues 
you would be fine with running a higher carrier frequency up to a certain extent. You got to remember, if you're switching these IGBTs a lot more often, what happens? Excess heat's going to happen. So these IGBTs are going to heat up quicker. So you may have to deal with the D rate, <clears throat> especially if you're loading this up to its full capacity. There's built-in safeties that will protect the drive, but uh, you're definitely firing those IGBTs more, which is going to create more heat. Hey, it makes a nicer waveform, but you got to deal with that. So a lot of uh, your commercial applications like this higher carrier frequency because they don't like to hear the motor upstairs. Also, with our voltage, I'm going to backtrack just a hair. With our voltage waveform, this looks like a square wave, but really this is like the RMS voltage or average voltage of the cycle. And if you would look at it as the average voltage, you would this would look a lot more sinusoidal than it visually looks like from our oscilloscope reading. So it's still pretty sinusoidal, but you really see that that difference with the current waveform. <clears throat> Just a little note there.